All right, let's pray and, and then we'll go to the Lord's Word. Father, we are so thankful and appreciative of the opportunity to come and worship you, to come and just bow before you for this moment and, Lord, to learn more about who you are and what it is that you desire for your people. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak loudly into our hearts, into our lives as we study your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit will open our eyes and our ears and make our hearts sensitive, that we, God, may uh, not only grasp the truth of your word, but that the truth of your word may cause us uh, to want to worship you more and more. And so we love you, and Lord, it's now as we come into your word that we pray your Holy Spirit would truly lead us and guide us. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Open your Bibles uh, to the book of John, and so we're in the Gospel of John, John chapter number four, and I'm continuing in our series. Last week, we spoke about fellowship, and what does it mean to fellowship? And we spoke about the word fellowship being koinonia, and how we spoke about unity and oneness. Uh, and I said today I, I want to take on another one of the, the, the things the church does, and I'm very careful not to call it a purpose of the church. There are those that have written books and, and they speak about a purpose-driven church, or they speak the purposes of the church. I, I firmly believe that there's only one purpose of the church, and it is this, to glorify God. Now, there are various things that we do uh, that contribute to that one purpose. Uh, and these things that we do all need to be scriptural. So as we go into the scriptures, we want to know what is it that the church does in order to bring glory to God. Uh, last week, uh, Wednesday, we spoke on fellowship and how the oneness or the unity of the church uh, brings glory to God. And now tonight, I want to spend time on speaking about this topic, worship. Worship. Now read with me in John 4, uh, we all know the story of the, the, the woman of Samaria and how Jesus meets with this woman at the well and uh, he is now going to uh, say to her that um, uh, she is to give him water and uh, he says that he will give her water and she will never thirst again and then he reveals things about her that no one knows and uh, then she asks him a very pertinent question. The woman says to him in verse number 19 of John chapter 4, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where the people ought to worship. Jesus said to a woman, Believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Now listen to this verse. But the hour is coming and is now here. So Jesus is not only speaking of the fact that uh, there's going to come a time when people are going to do what he's about to say, but he says the time is here. And is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father. In spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. What stands out to me here is the question she poses. Remember, he's in Samaria. And Samaria, or the Samaritans, are are the half-breeds, if you would. They are the ones that uh, when... The Israelites were taken into captivity. The elderly, the sickly, the children were left behind. They would um, uh, co-mingle with the Gentiles. uh, And um, they were viewed as not a pure people. And they were saying, well, we worship here. But the Jews, now the true Jews, they worship up in Jerusalem. And so she's speaking about place. And Jesus says this. He's really saying it's not about place. There's going to be a time when people will worship in spirit and in truth. It's not going to be about location. Remember in the Old Testament, it was about location. It had everything to do with location. Uh, Wherever God was, the people were worshiping Him. Uh, When they were in the desert, He had the tabernacle. And later on, we have the temple. And there the people are going to sacrifice. They're going to worship God. Where here in the New Testament, we find Jesus saying it's not about location, 
but it has everything to do with worshiping in spirit and in truth. So what does this mean, to worship in spirit and in truth? I want to get there tonight, um, but before I can do that, I have to clarify some things just so we know what we're speaking about when we speak about worship. Worship is not a holy word or a special word. It's a typical word that is used throughout uh, the Bible, and it speaks about giving honor or extolling a higher deity or extolling a higher creature or expo- extolling or giving honor to one greater. And so the same word, this word worship, is the, worshiping God is the same word used to worship idols, to worship Baal, to worship. Worship is just a word. There's nothing holy about this word worship. Uh, the word worship comes from this word um, proskuneo, uh, which means to prostrate oneself. Uh, it comes from the picture in the Old Testament and in, in, in uh, pre-medieval times where one would bow the knee uh, and kiss the hand of one, proskuneo, to, to bring oneself down on your knee and to take the hand and to kiss the ring is literally what it would mean, worship to bow down to someone. The word latreo is also used in the same sense of bowing down and worshiping someone else. What do we mean when we speak about Christian worship? Well, Christian worship uh, is not a physical act as much as it is a spiritual condition. It's not so much a a physical act as much as it is a spiritual condition. Everything that we do is to worship God. So we have this, this, this myth that we deal with. I go to church to worship. Well, we do worship here, but if you're not worshiping in your car and at your home and, and in your bathroom and in your bedroom and uh, at your workplace, you're not worshiping here. Because it's not a physical act, it is a spiritual condition. Uh, it is who we are. And that's why Paul would say things like, whether you eat or drink, do all things to the glory of God. You worship God by being obedient to God. You worship God by living a life that is sacrificed to Him. So when we speak about worship, what we're saying is this. We're saying it is a lifestyle of living, extolling God or bringing glory to God. Secondly, what we're saying is this, to worship in spirit... It means that it is a, there's something with regards to the spiritual realm that's taking place. And, and I don't mean this, that you ought to go into some trance or something. No, no. Uh, for one to worship in spirit and in truth, one needs to be spiritually alive. Remember the Bible says that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. But now because of the love of Christ, the love of God, he sent Christ that we are now alive in him. We are now spiritually alive. That's why it is a myth to think that people who are not saved are able to worship in a Christian worship service. Now they can come and raise their hands. They can come and raise their voices. And they can even come and fall on the ground and, and, and say they're worshiping. But in reality, how does a dead person worship in spirit when they're spiritually dead? Uh, A very prominent church has said uh, one of their purposes is to create an environment where the lost can come and worship God and find Christ. Do you see the fallacy in that? That the lost may come and worship God and find him. They're, they're, it's incapable for them to worship God. Only saved people are able to truly worship God. Because everything that is done outside of in the spirit, in other words, a spiritual condition, being saved into the kingdom of God, is nothing but in the flesh and is worth nothing. So it's only true believers, those that have been born again, they've trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they have given their lives to Him, they've surrendered. They are the ones that are able to worship. Uh, I love the statement that to worship in spirit and in truth, in spirit is all of me, in truth, 
worshiping all of Him. It is the truth of who He is that causes us to worship. So the next point is this. Worship is not an emotional um, exercise. It's amazing how people walk out of a worship service and they will say this, I didn't feel it today. I didn't feel it today. I'm, going, I'm looking for a church where I can feel it. What happens when you quit feeling it? You see, Christianity is never propelled forward by feelings, always by faith. Never by feeling, always by faith. Now, does that mean that, our, that we, are, we become stoic? Does that mean that, that, that we become absolutely unemotional? No. Uh, the paradigm shift that needs to happen is this. The truth of who he is stirs the emotion in worship. Unfortunately, today there's been a change in churches when it comes to a worship service. Uh, it is the loud music. Uh, it, it is the vibrations. It is the, the pace of the music. It's the, the so many fast and so many slow. I, I remember working at a Christian um, conference center in South Africa, and we had one specific group that would come through. And one of the things that we as a center would do is we would give them not only a facility but a sound system and someone to run it. And the person who ran the sound system would be given a list. At this point, play this song, then this song, then this song. And, and uh, uh, when the preacher does this, you've got to play that. And there were certain things, and it became an emotional manipulation of the people. And they left there on a high. Everyone had worshipped, but Christ was never exalted. And so worship really had never taken place. To worship is to extol or to hold up high. Uh, it comes from the, the Anglo-Saxon word worthship, which means to ascribe worship to him. So some guys may worship their motorcycles. I'm looking at Luke because we've got something in common here. <laughs> uh, other guys may worship their wives. Other guys may worship their workplace. Or, or they may, may worship an uh, Alabama team that got killed on Monday night. I had to get that in somewhere, right? <laughs> uh, and and the, what they're doing is they're ascribing worship. They're saying this team, this item, this person, this thing is worthy of my adoration. Christian worship is coming and realizing the truth of who he is. And that causes us to want to prostrate ourselves before him, causes us wanting to raise our voices and lift our hearts. But more than that, it causes us to want to live a life dedicated to him. Worship is sacrificial. Worship is sacrificial. Jesus said the time will come when the people worship in spirit and in truth, for God is a spirit uh, or is spirit and therefore needs to be worshipped in spirit. So we've spoken about being born again. And we've spoken about the, the fact of who he is that ex pushes it. So let's get very practical as to what do we do when we speak about worship. And now I want you to cancel out of your minds a worship service. You got it? Because worship that takes place here, corporate worship, is only a nano part of your worship. A nano part. Uh, it, it is, if you take the amount of time that you're in this building, maybe two hours, three hours, four hours at the very most a week, depends on whether the preacher will shut up or not. Um, it, it depends. But you live 24 hours, seven days a week. Work that out. So is worship a compartmentalization for four hours a week? Or does God, is he worthy, worthship, worthship, do we ascribe worship to him of our entire lives? I will propose to you tonight that worship is always sacrificial and worship is a lifestyle. Uh, it is not an event. It is not an action. It is a lifestyle. And I think the best place to go to find that 
is in the book of Romans. Go to Romans chapter 12 with me, if you would. So in order to, to speak on Romans 12, I have to back up into 11. And so that's what I'll do to keep it in context. Now remember what the Apostle Paul is doing from Romans chapter 1 through chapter 11. He is laying out the wonderful doctrine of the grace of God. He is speaking about how man is lost, hopeless, but Christ is a Savior, that he has come to save us. He's spoken about the wonderful gift of the Savior. Chapter 8, he starts speaking about the wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so we go on. So the first 11 chapters is, is deeply, deeply doctrinal in its teaching. And when he gets to the end of chapter number 11, um, he's, and I'm, I want to go back with you, if you would, to verse 32. And then we're going to run into chapter 12. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Now, verse 33, listen to the Apostle Paul as he makes a, a, a passionate declaration. He says, Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. This guy's not done with, with, the, with the book yet. That, 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 that should be at the end. That's like a conclusion kind of statement. You, you don't conclude, uh, you don't put that in the middle of a book somewhere. You know, that's like a concluding, it's like all these chapters are now, oh, the, the depths. But, but it's as if he can't hold himself back. And he says, oh, the depths of the riches, the wisdom, the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And now you think this is where the book ends. I mean, it's like, that is a wonderful doxology. I mean, what an awesome way to end this book. But now immediately he leads into I appeal to you, therefore, on a basis of chapters 1 through chapter 11, all this that has been said, all these, these wonders about the Lord, because of who He is, because of all things are from Him and through Him and to Him, because of all of this, I appeal. And it's a strong word, this word appeal that is used. It is literally Him saying, I beg you, I implore you, I, 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 I compel you. It's a very strong word. Brothers. That's very important. He's not speaking to the world because they're not able to do what he's about to appeal to them to do. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God that is good and acceptable and perfect. Notice he doesn't speak about the feelings. He doesn't speak about the emotions. He speaks about the mind, that you may discern by the testing. Isn't that amazing? That after he has stated that everything is from him, through him, to him, and all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. He does not end there. He goes on into a passage where he says, the result of this, because you know this, and the word that he uses here, by the mercies of God, present your bodies. He's saying, because of the mercy of God, because of what God has done, what are these mercies of God? Well, I'd have to take you back to chapter 1, and I encourage you to do that. Go and write down, start in chapter 1, and go write down the wonderful gifts of God. Here's the mercies of God. God demonstrated his love for us in this, or while we were yet sinners, that Christ would die for us. Here's the mercy of God. Those that confess the name of the Lord will be saved. Those that, for those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If I confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. 
Here is the mercy of God. Chapter 8, the Holy Spirit that discerns the mind of God. That when I'm unable to pray, He prays on my behalf. That I have the Holy Spirit residing within me. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead. This is all Roman stuff. And he's saying, because of all these things, look at this. The truth of who he is, this should cause you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This word offer or present is a, a, um, a temple word, if you would, or a priestly word. A word that is used in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament that, that would speak of to lay down on an altar, to present uh, and so this is the mind picture that I hope you'll, you'll get from the presenting your bodies as living sacrifices. Uh, it is one that would come to the temple and they would bring with them whatever the, um, the offering is that they could afford. And they would bring it wholeheartedly before the Lord. And the priest would take that and he would go and lay it down on the altar and present it before God. Uh, on this burnt offering and the the Smoke would rise and this would be a, a savor in the nostrils of God because they brought the first and the best to him. And so that's the picture that you should have in your mind. This is the picture you should have in your mind that God the Father brought his very best. Not an angel and not any other, but his only begotten son. And he laid him down on the altar of the cross as a sacrifice that the wrath of God may be appeased. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And now he calls us to present ourselves on his altar. And not, not present a portion of our lives, not, 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 not to present a, 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 a segment of our family, but, but to present your bodies. It speaks of a wholeness. It speaks of an entirety. To present yourself entirely to God. In other words, there is not a place in your life that you can say, I am keeping this for myself. You see, God does not require uh, just a, a partial sacrifice. He's calling for total obedience in every area of our lives. In order for us to truly say that I am worshiping God, we have to look at the lifestyle. Am I living a life that says you are worthy, you are worthy, you are worthy? And that is not easy to do. Because we deal with the flesh. We deal with the, with the sin that rages war. Man, that is a powerful thought, isn't it? That we have the sin within that rages war against us. It's almost as if the sin inside has has formed the battalion against us and raging a war against us. But we're to stand firm in Christ. He said, I will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. And when tempted, I'll give you a way out. And God is faithful. You can read about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's not always easy to live a life, sacrifice. One, one author has said the... the, the Difficult thing about a living sacrifice is it always seems to crawl off of the altar. Hey, I can identify with that. I can identify with that. Here I am, Lord. God, everything, take it all. My, my, my finances, my, my family, my sexuality, my relationships, my, my thought life, the attitudes I carry, my time, my talent. Lord, it's all yours. And before I know it, I'm sticking my nails into the sides of that altar and I'm trying to pull off and I'm trying to save a piece of Anton. You do it too. I know you do. You see, how then do we live a life of worship? Well, according to the passage, it is, Living it not only in spirit but in truth. Knowing who he is brings forth an instinctive celebration and a compelling consecration of ourselves to God. It brings forth an instinctive celebration of who he is 
and a compelling consecration of ourselves to all that he is. It all begins with a high view of God. It all begins with a high view of God. Understanding just who he is and what he has done. You know, I have found that when, when I'm not living on fire for the Lord, when I feel like my, my, my heart has gone a little bit cold, many times it's one of these two things. Either I have forgotten just who he is and I've become so familiar with him that I've lost the wonder and the awe. Or I start thinking that I'm more important than him. I don't say that though, right? I don't say that. You'll never hear me say I'm more important than God. If you ever hear me say that, I almost said shoot me, but I know there's so many concealed carriers in this room. <laughs> you will. Um, <laughs> You'll never hear Anton say that with his mouth. But the honest truth, there are days that Anton displays that with his actions. When I'm praying with my, my head and my mouth, thy will be done, thy kingdom come. And I'm living, my will be done, my kingdom come. You see, worship, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is not about coming here and paying a tithe or raising a hand or singing a song or playing an instrument or whatever it is. Worship is a lifestyle, a lifestyle of sacrifice consecrated to him in order for us to grasp this compelling consecration, there's a forbidden conformation. Listen to this. Here is the, con here is the, the consecration. Offer your, or present your bodies as living sacrifices that are holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, do not be conformed to this world. There is a forbidden conformation. God forbids it that we should be conformed into the image of this world. Let us remember this, that, that, that we have been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us remember we have been conformed or transformed into the likeness of Christ. And there's a daily con transformation that's taking place even now, and there will be a day of glorification and we'll be just as he is. And I can't wait for that day. But he has given his spirit who resides within us. How about that? You can worship in spirit because you have the Holy Spirit residing in you. You don't have to go to a temple where he, he resides. You don't have to go into a tabernacle where he meets with you. You are the holy of holies of a holy God. Why would we want to conform this holy of holies of the living God into the pattern of the world? The Apostle Paul spoke very loudly about that. Boy, he it was one of the things that led me to, when, when I just came to Christ, it really broke my heart when I realized the things that I had done and the things I was doing. When he speaks about to make one Christ with a prostitute. What do you mean? How could you do that? And you've got the Holy Spirit residing within you. Do you not know that you've been purchased with a price? Your body is a temple of God who lives in you. God forbid that we be conformed to the patterns of this world. 
And when it comes to worship, God forbid that our worship be conformed to the patterns of this world. In the way that we live, that we worship the same gods they worship. Remember, I'm not just speaking about in, in our sanctuary. I'm speaking about a lifestyle. But God forbid that even when we come together for a, a corporate worship time, when we want to raise our hearts together, when we want the truth of Christ to penetrate our hearts and to stir our emotions to who he is. Remember, we are emotional beings. God forbid that we bring the pattern of the world into the sanctuary of God, that we start worshiping like the world worships. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. Ha. How in the world does this happen? Here it is. Not by the stirring of your emotions, and not by becoming a stoic, uh, but by the renewal of your mind. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. By the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, is what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, when we are transformed into his likeness through the renewing of the mind, God reveals himself to us, reveals his will to us. Have you ever said, Lord, I, I just need to know your will in this? Anyone ever done that? I've done that a lot. <laughs> like, like a lot. And the sad commentary on me is this, that there have been times that the Lord has said, why would you ask me? for my will in, in these special areas in your life, when you're not even obeying the basics of that which I've already revealed to you. I've given you my will. Here it is. This is the will of God that you be saved. This is the will of God that you be sanctified. This is the will of God that you suffer for the cause of Christ. This is the will of God. And, and, and so he has given his will, and then we say, well, Lord, I... I really don't want to live like that, but would you show me what job I should take? Would you show me where I should move to? Would you show me your will in this decision? And the Lord's like, as long as you're not right with me, it doesn't matter what you do. You can go work at this place, work at that place. You can marry this person, marry that person. It doesn't matter what you do. As long as you're not right with me, nothing's going to be right. Worship. Worship is a lifestyle of sacrifice. Boy, I could speak all night just on worship. So I'm going to leave it at this. A true understanding of worship. I want to backtrack to last week. Can I do that like for two minutes? Is that okay with you all? A true understanding of fellowship. Fellowship is not a purpose of the church. It is a means. Unity. Unity oneness to bring glory to God. Worship is not a purpose of the church. It's not something that we do. It's who we are. We live a life. And as we are living this life individually, remember you are the body of Christ, individually as parts and corporately together. We all affect each other. What you do in your bedroom affects me. What I say in, in private affects you. The, the words proceed from our mouth, the places we go. We all affect each other. I think of the sin of Achan. You'll remember that in the Old Testament, sinning in the camp and how it affected everybody. Yeah. So uh, when we as individuals live a life of worship, that we're ascribing worship to God, because we've been empowered by the Holy Spirit, we've been b born again by Him, He's living within us, residing within us, enabling us to worship God. God is exalted. Does that make sense? It is not an activity that we do because it's why we exist. We exist to fellowship. We exist to worship. We exist to evangelize. No, no, we exist to bring glory to God. Therefore, we are one fellowship. Therefore, we live lives of worship to God. Therefore, he's exalted. Amen? Next week, I'll be speaking on the importance of ministry. And what, are, what is ministry? And, and how does our ministry as a church work together to bring glory to God? 
It's not a purpose, not why we exist to do ministry. We exist to bring glory to God. And how the ministry we do, how does that bring glory to God? So that'll be next week. Amen? Let me pray. Father, we are thankful for the time we've had together. I pray that you would bless each one, that you would give us a heart of worship. And Lord, if we have missed the mark somewhere, if we have gotten off on a tangent and thought that worship was just something that we do, an action that, that you, God, would bring to our minds the necessity of consecrating ourselves completely to you. Lord, may we, as a church, desire to live 24-7 exalting you so that when we come together for these couple hours or three or four hours in a week, uh, to, to raise our voices and lift our hearts and our hands before you, that you truly will be uh, pleased with that. Lord, that when you look down upon Lake Lord Baptist Church, that you will not see hypocrisy on a Sunday as we put on our, our Sunday faces or a Wednesday when we put on our Wednesday faces. But God, uh, that, that we will be people of integrity. That what you, what you see of us in our homes and in our workplaces will be what you see of us in our worship service. Just living lives fully consecrated to you. Lord, thank you that you are a God of grace and forgiveness. That when we fail, that you're the God that forgives us and restores us. The one who never fails us, you're the faithful God. You're the all-powerful God. There's no one like you. And I think of the scripture in Romans that if you be for us, who can be against us? Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. And so I thank you, Father, that you have purchased the victory through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, through the shedding of his blood on the cross. And we thank you that it's through the blood that we're able to be saved. We thank you for the regeneration that comes about by your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you have indwelt us. And Lord, help us to be healed, surrendered to you, that you may live your life through us. And this I pray in Jesus' name.